structure. Um, so um, there are still people in the waiting room. So uh, let's wait uh, a few seconds to start. Um, so has the live stream started? Oh, okay, yes. Okay, I see myself. Great. So, um, well, uh, this second uh, day of lectures has a program that is uh, very similar to the one of yesterday. So we'll start uh, with uh, Leonardo Pacciani Mori, who is give the second part of the tutorial on uh, nonlinear dynamics. So without uh, saying anything further, please, Leonardo, um, you can share the screen and- uh, yes. Okay. So you can see my slides, right? Yes. Perfect. So hi everyone, welcome back. So before I get started on the second part of this tutorial, are there any questions about what I showed yesterday? Please again, if you have any questions, please raise at the end with the Zoom feature. You have to go on participants. There are three dots and then you can raise them. No one is doing that, so I think you can... Uh, okay, yeah. perfect. So uh, I will start right where we stopped yesterday. So yesterday we were talking about Lyapunov functions. So in general, we were talking about how to study the stability of uh, equilibria in nonlinear systems. And I was introducing the use of Lyapunov functions uh, as a tool to do that. In particular, let me just repeat Lyapunov second theorem so that we get uh, on the same page we were yesterday. So if you remember, I, uh, I told you that if we have a generic nonlinear differential equation with X star and equilibrium, and we suppose that in a neighborhood of X star, we can define a function W uh, such that uh, this function here has a minimum on the equilibrium, <clears throat> then the stability of the equilibrium can be studied by looking at uh, how uh, this function w behaves along the trajectories of the system. So for example, if we find out that the time derivative of this function along the trajectory is zero, so if, if this function is constant along the trajectories of the system, then x star will be an equilibrium stable at all times. On the other hand, if the time derivative is non-positive, so either negative or uh, equal to zero, the equilibrium is simply stable. If the time derivative is strictly, strictly negative, so if the function is decreasing along the trajectories, uh, the equilibrium is asymptotically stable. And if the time derivative is strictly positive, so if, if the function is increasing along the trajectories, the equilibrium is unstable. And then any function W defined with uh, this property uh, here is called the Lyapunov function for the equilibrium. Is everything, everything clear? Okay, so uh, we talked about this a little bit already yesterday, but I want, just want to highlight the pros and the cons of using this approach. Now you see that this is actually a very powerful approach because it can basically give us an almost complete information about uh, an equilibrium. And it gives conditions for stability that are sufficient but not necessary, meaning that, of course, we can have that an equilibrium is stable or unstable or anything else without necessarily having uh, a defined Lyapunov function. So finding Lyapunov function is not necessary for determining the stability of an equilibrium, but it's sufficient. The price that we have to pay for having such a powerful tool, unfortunately, is that we can't uh, use it always. So it's not easy to find Lyapunov functions in general in nonlinear systems with, as I told you yesterday, the notable exception of uh, conserved quantities. So if we have a system, if we know that a system has a conserved quantity, generally that quantity is a good uh, first choice for that Lyapunov function. Sorry for the ambulance uh, in the background. Uh, but if we don't know uh, if the system has a conserved quantity, we can't, uh, I mean, we have to use our intuition to find a Lyapunov function. So let me show you a concrete example uh, to see how we can use the uh, Lyapunov functions. And I want to show that uh, using uh, the Lotka-Volterra equations. 
Now, Professor Weitz yesterday uh, in, uh, in his lecture mentioned that the, Lyapuno, the, sorry, the Lotka Volterra equations actually have a conserved quantity. So let me show you how uh, we can find it. So these are the equations of our system. Again, I'm going to do some very simple computations, but they are very non-rigorous. So again, I, I'm sorry if you're a mathematician. But uh, uh, what, what can we, we can do here uh, is basically, let's try dividing the first question, uh, sorry, the first equation for the second. So we get dx over dy. And notice that this is not a general method. So what I'm doing here is just uh, trying something and then see if I can find a conserved quantity. This is not like a general technique that can be used uh, always. But in this case, we can write we can rewrite the equations uh, in this way. So here I'm just factorizing uh, um, x and y. So now that we have written this, we can separate the variables. So I bring on one side everything that depends on x and on the other everything that depends on y. So you see that we can write the x times delta x minus gamma over x equal to dy alpha minus beta y over y. Okay, so we simply rewrite this as follows. So we divide by x or y on the two sides. So we have delta minus gamma over x equal to dy alpha over y minus beta. But these are very simple functions that we can integrate very easily because integrating this uh, constant here, we get delta x plus a constant. This here gives minus log, uh, sorry, minus gamma times uh, the logarithm of x. This here plus a constant, of course. This here gives the alpha logarithm of y plus a constant. And this here gives minus beta y. So in the end, basically, we have that delta x minus gamma logarithm of x plus beta y minus alpha logarithm of y, which we call w, is a constant. So indeed, we have found a conserved quantity for uh, the Lotka Volterra system. So, sorry, let me just jump here. So again, this is not a general uh, a general technique. Every time we have to see how our system behaves and uh, do some trial and errors, but in this case, we are lucky. So we have a constant quantity. Can we use it as a Lyapuno function to study the uh, stability of the two equilibria that we know the Lotka Volterra system has? So let's see. Let me uh, write this down again, sorry. Okay. So we have the W is delta x minus gamma logarithm of x plus beta y minus alpha logarithm of y. Okay, so in order to see if um, this is a Lyapun we can use this function as a Lyapunov function, we first have to see if uh, the two equilibria that we know the Lotka Volterra system has, which are uh, this one that I'm writing here, are actually uh, minima of this function. So let's compute the partial derivatives of uh, this function here. You see that they are very easy to compute. And so for example, the partial derivative with respect to x will be delta minus gamma over x and the partial derivative with respect to y will be beta minus alpha over y. So the first thing that you can see is that these derivatives are not defined in the origin in this equilibrium here because of course they uh, diverge for x and y equal to zero. So the first thing that we can see is that we cannot uh, use w as a Lyapunov function for the origin in this case. <clears throat> However, you can see very easily that if we substitute the coordinates of this equilibrium here, in both cases, we get zero. So this non-trivial non equilibrium is indeed uh, an extremum, let's say, for this function. But then you see that if we, uh, compute the second derivatives of this function, we get uh, functions that are always positive. So we are sure that uh, this non-trivial equilibrium is not only a minimum of the function, but a global minimum, because it's the only one. 
So we can use, sorry, we can use this function, uh, we can try to use this function as uh, Aliapuno function for the non-trivial equilibrium. So what we have to do now is compute the uh, time derivative of the function along the, the trajectories. So simply, if we compute the time derivative of this function, again, I can just write it down here. You see, it's very easy that in this case, we have delta x dot, uh, x dot over x gamma, y dot, and alpha y dot over y. So in order to see how this behaves on the along the trajectories of the Lotka Volterra system, we just have to substitute the expression of uh, y dot and uh, x dot from sorry from uh, from the Lotka Volterra system. Now this is a very simple uh, computation. So you see that we, if we substitute here, we have uh, delta x alpha minus delta beta x y minus uh, here we have gamma alpha plus gamma beta y plus beta delta x y minus beta gamma and then we have minus uh, alpha delta x uh, yes sorry and for plus alpha gamma i am probably uh, forgetting a uh, something of course no okay that's everything. So you see that, for example, this term here and this term here cancel out, then this term here and this term here cancel out, this term and this term cancel out, and then this term and this term, uh, sorry, here I forgot to remove a y, this term and this term cancel out. So in the end, this quantity is equal to zero. Now, we could have guessed that from the fact that that we know that W is a conserved quantity of the system, but still, we have computed this explicitly. So if we look at the definitions that I've given you before in the Lyapunov uh, uh, theorem, what we have now is that the non-trivial equilibrium of the Lotka Volterra system is actually stable at all times. While again, remember that we can say anything in this case on the origin because this function here is not defined uh, for x and y equal to zero. Is everything clear for now? Are there any questions? I think we can take the silence as... Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's go on. Mm, now, Professor Weitz yesterday showed us how the trajectories of the, of the Lotka Volterra look like, but I just want you to uh, show that again. So for this particular choice of the parameters, you see that it, indeed we have these uh, solutions oscillating uh, uh, anti-clockwise around uh, this uh, stable equilibrium here. And this is just an example of the oscillations that we've seen of also yesterday, where you see that the uh, prey population peaks before the predator population. Okay, so this is more or less how we can use the Apuno functions um, to come to study, sorry, the stability of equilibria in nonlinear system. The other tool that I've told you we can use uh, in this sense is spectral analysis. Now, spectral analysis is actually uh, a simpler tool uh, and basically consists in linearizing a nonlinear system around an equilibrium. The basic idea that is behind spectral analysis is the fact that we can approximate uh, a nonlinear system with a linear one if we restrict to, uh, let's say, a neighborhood of an equilibrium. So what we would like to do uh, in general is given our nonlinear system, we tailor expand this function f around an equilibrium. So we will have this term here, which is of course equal to zero because x star uh, is an equilibrium. Then we will have a linear term, a quadratic term, and then all other sorts of uh, terms. And what we, what we would like to do is basically approximate uh, our nonlinear system with the linearized, uh, the, the linear one, where this j here is called the Jacobian matrix. And it's basically the matrix of the partial derivatives of this function computed uh, in the equilibrium. Of course, this is a matrix if we are considering a system in more than one dimension, but if we have just, if we have that X is just a simple one dimensional uh, variable, this is just the partial derivative uh, of the function. Uh, the, basically how uh, this approach works is basically by 
studying the eigenvalues of this matrix because if we know this matrix then its eigenvalues can give us some information about the stability of the equilibrium in particular uh, what we can do in this case is given by the so-called Lyapunov's first first theorem which basically states the following if again we have a generic nonlinear system and x star is an equilibrium then if all the eigenvalues of this Jacobian matrix have negative real part, the equilibrium is asymptotically stable. On the other hand, if at least one of them has a positive real part, then the equilibrium is unstable. Is that clear? I mean, I'm going to explain. There is a question okay. uh, uh, by Mohamed who asks if this concept is similar to uh, PCA. Principal component. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, PCA in general is something that you do with rectangular matrices. So matrices which doesn't don't have the same number of rows and columns. In this case, however, you always have square matrices because I mean, uh, if uh, X is a vector of dimension N, of course, also F will have to be a dimension in, uh, sorry, a function in N dimensions. And so this will be an N times N matrix. And so in this case, we, we, we use directly eigenvalues because we know that eigenvalues and eigenvectors are defined for, uh, um, for rectangular matrices, uh, sorry, for square matrices. PCA is something that we, we do in rectang with rectangular matrices, but this is just not, uh, not this case. Is that clear? Okay. So, uh, you see that compared to using Lyapunov functions, this uh, approach is actually much simpler because it can be applied to any nonlinear linear system. So as long as we know explicitly how this, this function uh, is defined, we can always apply uh, this approach. And this theorem actually is quite powerful in the sense that it tells us that the stability properties of the equilibrium of a nonlinear of a nonlinear system, sorry, are exactly the same of the linearized system. So we can use uh, this approach to study equilibria in a nonlinear system. The price that we have to pay for having uh, an approach that is simpler and easier to apply is that it doesn't necessarily always give us all the information on an equilibrium. Now, you see already that it can on, only tell us if an equilibrium is either asymptotically stable or unstable, but there are also cases where this approach can tell us anything about an equilibrium. Because you see that if we have at least one eigenvalue with no real part and all other uh, eigenvalues with strictly negative real part, we are neither in these two cases. And so we cannot say anything in this, uh, in this case. What we can do in this situation is just, uh, for example, using other tools, drawing stream plots, or seeing how the equation behaves at higher orders and try to guess something about this equilibrium. Now, um, I want to introduce an, an, another uh, type of stability that we can find in dynamical system, and that is also relevant sometimes in ecology, which is marginal stability. Now, in general, an equilibrium is defined uh, as marginally stable if it is neither asymptotically stable, neither unstable. But in particular, it is marginally stable when all the eigenvalues of this Jacobian matrix here are purely imaginary. So it is a particular case of uh, an equilibrium being neither asymptotically stable nor unstable because you see that the case in this third point here is one of these cases, but in this case, we can't say anything on the, on the equilibrium. If on the other hand, all the eigenvalues are purely imaginary, the equilibrium is marginally stable. Okay, if there are no questions. Okay, so let's move on. And let's see a couple of- uh, There is actually one. Oh, okay. Can you give an example of uh, marginally stable? Yes, like I, will, I, I, I will give you an example in a few slides. Okay, thank you. So, so let's see first a couple of uh, concrete sorry, examples. Is, sorry, the, the, sorry you know, interrupt. There is another question from the chat. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, two. Uh, so one is asked by Tuan, so he's saying whether this approach uh, cannot say whether an equilibrium is stable uh, at all times. Okay. Ne, actually, no. The, the only thing that this, uh, that this uh, approach can say if is an equilibrium is asymptotically stable. This is the only the only thing that you can say. 
And uh, Miguel uh, is asking, what's the advantage of spectral analysis over stream plots? Uh, the, 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 advantage, uh, the advantage of spectral analysis is just that it, it seems, I mean, you just have to compute the derivatives and evaluate them. So it's something that you can always do very easily, even in very complicated system, in very in a very high number of dimensions with very complicated functions. Stream plots, I mean, are not always easy to draw because if you go above three dimensions, I mean, I don't know how to draw in four dimensions, so <laughs> it's not. It, it wouldn't be easy to to draw the stream plot on a system in more than three dimensions. So this is the advantage of spectral analysis. Yes. Uh, okay. But, oh, there's another question by Rasmita. Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, so my question is, uh, from the third point, so if we get uh, the case that when one eigenvalue is uh, zero and all others are negative, so uh, can you suggest any method that which we can consider? Sorry, I, I didn't hear correctly. I have some problem with audios. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so question is regarding to the third point, pros and cons. Okay. That when one one eigenvalue has non-real part and okay. all others are negative real part. So if yeah. we arise uh, to a system which uh, shows this kind of nature, then do you know, uh, can you suggest that what will be the next step? How to deal with this kind of system? Well, it, it, it actually depends on the system. I'm going to give you an example uh, again in a few slides where we are actually in uh, in this case here. Okay. 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 So. Thank you. No problem. So, um, if there are no other questions, okay. Okay. So let's see. So there is another one. Yeah. 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 For example. Uh, does a linear uh, stability implies stability of nonlinear? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 um, the result, I mean, the main message of this theorem is exactly this. I mean, that if you have that the linearized version of a system uh, close to an equilibrium is stable, then also the, uh, the real system, let's say, the equilibrium in the nonlinear system is uh, stable. So what this uh, theorem is, is saying is that as long as we are close to an equilibrium, we can use uh, the, I mean, we can use the linear stability to um, induce stability in nonlinear systems. And the same is true also for instability. Okay. Okay, so let's see a couple of uh, practical examples. So I first want to uh, show you again the very first example I've given you yesterday. So this nonlinear system with this cubic function. And just to remind uh, uh, ourselves, this is what we did when we uh, drew the stream plot of the system. So now I want to show you what spectral analysis would say in this case. So now we are, we are in a um, one-dimensional system. So the Jacobian in this case is simply the derivative. So we simply have to uh, derive this cubic function. And so we get a parabola in general. And then uh, we have to evaluate this parabola in these three uh, points here. So you see that if we evaluate this derivative in minus one and in two, we get positive values. While if we evaluate, evaluate it in zero, we get a negative value. So in this case, we can conclude by using spectral analysis that zero is an asymptotically stable equilibrium, while minus one and two are unstable. Again, because this is what the theorem says. And in this case, since we are in one dimension, the Jacobian is simply the derivative. And the value of the derivative is the, eigen, the only eigenvalue, basically, of the system in this case. OK, if there are no other questions, I go on with other examples. OK. So this is another interesting uh, uh, example. So we have a, a system in two dimensions, x dot equal minus x and y dot equal k y to the third with k a positive parameter. So this is the function that we have to start. Now you see that the only equilibrium of the system is the origin, because this is the only point where both uh, the first and the second components here are equal to 0. Now let's use spectral, an uh, spectral analysis let me write this down, x minus x and k y to the third. Now, spectral analysis tells us, tells us, let's compute the Jacobian matrix. So the Jacobian matrix, in this case, if we call these components f1 and f2, the Jacobian matrix 
looks like this dy f1 such dx f2 and dy f2 so this is the matrix of all the partial derivatives of um, the components of this function so in this case this matrix looks like minus one zero zero and three k y squared okay so you see that this component here uh, i mean does um, doesn't depend on x while this component uh, does depend on y if we compute this matrix in the only equilibrium of the system so the origin you see that we get uh, this matrix here which is basically a, di a diagonal matrix with minus one and zero on the diagonal so in this case the two eigenvalues of the system are minus one and zero so you see that we are exactly in uh, the third case that I've shown you uh, before, in which this system cannot tell us anything about this equilibrium, because one eigenvalue has neg a strictly negative real part, and the other one has zero real part. So what we can we do in this case? Let's try using some tools that we have already seen. So let's try drawing the stream plot of the system. So in this case, the state space of the system is the whole uh, b-dimensional uh, plane. And here we have uh, our equilibrium, the origin. So let's try, for example, to see what happens to the trajectories on the axis here. So let me write this down. So you see that, let me rewrite the equations, minus x and k, y to the third. Okay, so you see, for example, that if we, if we start with uh, x0 equal to 0, so if we start on the y-axis, let me draw this here so that it is a little bit more clear. So if we start from the y-axis, basically our system becomes x dot y dot equal to 0 k y to the third. So basically, if we start on the y-axis, the system will always move uh, on the y-axis. And you see that uh, y dot will be positive when y is positive and negative when y is negative, because k, we are assuming that k is positive. So the solutions on the y-axis will move in this direction. Okay, similarly, if we start on the uh, x-axis, so if y0 in, uh, in the initial condition is zero, our system will become x dot uh, y dot such equal minus x zero. So if we start uh, on the x-axis, the solutions will move on the x-axis. And in particular, x dot will be negative when x is positive. So the solutions will move in this way. And it will be positive when x is negative. So in this case, the solutions will move like this. So you see that on the axis, the stream plot look like this. So from this, we can see that actually the origin is an unstable equilibrium. Because you see that here, the solutions are moving away from this point. Now, if we want to do something a little bit more, we can do exactly the same thing that I've shown you yesterday when we drew the stream plot of the Lotka Volterra uh, system. So we can look at when uh, this function here and this function here is positive so that we know basically the general direction of uh, the solutions of the system. So we don't know exactly with this approach how these curves here move, but we know that they point in this direction. To show you that what I am doing here actually makes sense, this is basically the real aspect of the stream plot of the system uh, computed numerically. So this is a numerical computation of the stream plot. So you see that indeed uh, in this direction, we have that the solutions are going toward the origin. In this direction here, they are moving away, and so the origin is unstable. And in, in the four quadrants, you see that the solutions are moving along these curves, but they are pointing in the right directions. Okay. Now, finally, in this case, the origin is also called a saddle point, because it, when, it, when it happens that an equilibrium is, uh, let's say, asymptotically stable along a direction, but unstable in the other, uh, often it is called uh, a saddle point. So is everything clear here? OK. So let's go on with other examples. OK. Let's see now, for example, OK, sorry. An, an interesting uh, exercise that I invite you to do, or maybe if we have enough time at the end of, the, of this lecture, I can show you, is, is see what happens to this equilibrium 
where k is negative or equal to zero. Equal to zero is a little bit less interesting case, but at least what happens to the system with k is uh, becomes negative. Okay. So let's see now uh, what can uh, spectral analysis tell us uh, when we study the logistic equation and the lotka volterra system. So in particular, if we take the logistic equation, we have a very uh, simple uh, unidimensional system. So if we want to use spectral analysis, we first have to compute the derivative of the, of the function. Then, for example, if we compute this derivative in the uh, non-trivial equilibrium, so k, you see that we get minus r, which is negative because remember that these uh, two parameters, r and k, are always positive. And so looking at the theorem that I've shown you before, this means that the non-trivial equilibrium k is asymptotically stable. On the other hand, if we compute this uh, derivative in zero, which is the other uh, equilibrium of the logistic equation, we get r, which is positive. And so we can again conclude that uh, zero in this case is an unstable equilibrium. On the other hand, let's see what we can say for the lotka volterra equation. So this, again, is uh, our system. We do exactly what we did before. So we compute the matrix of the partial derivatives of uh, these functions with respect to the two variables. So this is the partial derivative of the first component with respect to x. This is the partial derivative of the first component with respect to y, etc. Now, if we complete this matrix in the trivial, let's say, equilibrium of the lotka volterra system, so no prey and no predators, you see that we get this matrix here. So again, a diagonal matrix with alpha and minus gamma uh, on the diagonal. So the eigenvalues in this case are alpha and minus gamma. And since alpha is a positive parameter, we have that one of the eigenvalues is positive. So spectral analysis in this case tells us that uh, the origin is unstable. And if you remember, Yesterday, when we uh, have drawn the uh, stream plot of the Lotka Volterra system, we saw that along the x axis, the solutions were actually moving in this direction. And so, we, we had, I mean, we already saw yesterday that uh, this was uh, an unstable equilibrium. Okay, so let's see what's happen what happens in the non trivial equilibrium. So, again, we have the same matrix here, but this time we have to compute it in this non trivial point. And if we substitute this, we, we get this matrix. Now, this is a very uh, easy matrix. So let's let's see. Let's compute the eigenvalues. Now, let me just write it down beta gamma over delta and delta alpha over beta. OK, so just to remind ourselves, the um, eigenvalues of a square matrix are computed by setting to zero the determinant of the determinant of the matrix minus lambda times the identity matrix. So let's do this. We have to compute the determinant of minus lambda minus beta gamma over delta, delta alpha over beta minus lambda, which is lambda squared minus uh, delta alpha over beta times minus beta gamma over delta. So you see that here we have delta and beta that uh, cancel out, and this must be equal to zero. So in the end, we have lambda squared equal minus gamma alpha. So lambda will be plus minus the imaginary unit time gamma alpha. So basically, this means that the Jacobian matrix of the lotka volterra equations in the non-trivial um, uh, equilibrium has only uh, purely imaginary uh, eigenvalues. So this means that if you look at uh, what I've told you before, that this equilibrium here is actually marginally stable. Is everything clear here? Okay, perfect. So let's move on. Let's see some other uh, example. In particular, I want to show you this example here. So now we have again a cubic function, but a slightly uh, different one. So if we apply also what we've seen uh, yesterday, you see that the equilibria of uh, this function, are, of this system, are three and are zero and plus minus one. Now let's use uh, spectral analysis. Uh, well, let's first draw the stream plot of this system. So if we draw the stream plot, you see that we get something. Oh, okay. Yeah. There, there is we... a question by Pablo Lechon. Please uh, um, ask. 
Is a mark stable like a stable or an asymptotically stable equilibrium, or, or is it just a different category? Sorry, is either a stable or or asymptotically stable. Okay, yeah, I mean, they are two different kinds of stability. I mean, they are similar, but not equal because uh, asymptotic stability, let me let me draw this here. So if we are, for example, in a unidimensional system and this is our equilibrium, asymptotic stability means that we know that the solutions are actually moving uh, towards the equilibrium. So if we look, for example, at how the solution behave uh, over time, like this, for example, here we have X star. So if X star is an asymptotic, uh, asymptotically stable equilibrium, we know it means that we know that the solutions are doing something like this. So they are actually going uh, towards this value. But if if we just if we are just saying that X star is a stable equilibrium, this is not necessarily true, and we just need that the solutions remain close to the equilibrium. So, for example, if we see that something like this happens, then X, is, and we see that the, the solution never goes away, so it never do, does something like, like this, for example, then we know that the equilibrium is stable. So asymptotically stable is just a particular case of stable. And um, Yeah, and I was asking about marginally. Ah, oh, sorry. Marginally stable uh, in, in this case basically means that there are, uh, um, in the definitions that I've given you before, means that there are os oscillations. Because uh, from linear theory, you may know that if the Jacobian matrix of a linear system has all purely imaginary uh, eigenvalue, this means that the solution is doing something like this. Without, uh, with, without actually tending uh, towards the value. So, uh, for example, if we had like damped oscillations, so something like this, this would be an asymptotically stable equilibrium. Well, if we had these sustained oscillations that never damp, never get damped, then the equilibrium is marginally stable. Thank you. No problem. So, okay. So in this case, if we draw the stream plot, uh, you see, again, just to remind ourselves, for example, in this interval, the function f is positive, so the solutions will be increasing. x will be increasing in the solutions. On the other hand, in this interval, the function is negative, uh, the function f here is negative, and so the x in the solutions will be decreasing. So you see that the stream plot suggests that this equilibrium here is unstable, where this and this here uh, are actually stable. Now let's see what we can say with spectral analysis. So here we have a cubic function. So we just have to uh, derive this function and compute it uh, in these three points. So you see that in zero, the derivative is positive and in plus minus one, the function is negative. So in this case, we have one unstable equilibrium and two uh, asymptotically stable equilibria. This is a very, the simplest uh, case in which a system can exhibit uh, bistability. Now we have seen an example of uh, bistability yesterday with uh, the lecture of Professor Staver, but in generally uh, we can, we say that a system is bistable or even multi-stable if it has two or more alternative uh, stable states. Let me show you how we can reinterpret this, uh, this problem with, I mean, and this will probably make things a little bit more clear. So let's uh, rewrite the same system as a particle in a potential. So in this case, we will have an equation of motion like this, so that the acceleration of x is minus the derivative of a given potential. And we choose this potential simply because it's the one that uh, once derived and the sign is changed, uh, gives us the function that we were using before. So in this case, it means that our system is a particle moving in this energy potential. So you see that the equilibria are the minima of the uh, potential, and there are two uh, alternative uh, stable states. Now, the interesting thing about bistable or multi-stable systems, as we saw also yesterday, is that external perturbations can move the system from one equilibrium to the other. So for example, if we again are considering the um, particle in the potential, suppose for example, that the particle is in, in minus one, if we give it enough kinetic energy and by enough, I mean at least the difference between this value and this value here. What happens is that our particle will go in this direction, 
will override this, will go uh, over this potential wall, and then it will fall back in this other stable equilibrium. And if we do that in the other direction, of course, the same happens. So you see that external perturbations can switch the stable state in which the system uh, lies. And this, for example, we have seen an, a concrete example yesterday with the savanna and uh, forest switch in a patch of, 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 of lands. Uh, and so this is something that can happen and any time we have uh, more than one alternative stable equilibrium. Uh, is this clear? Are there questions? Okay. So, mm, oh, the last. This one. Okay. Yeah, tell me. Uh, is this potential the Lyapunov function for this system? Sorry, is the potential? Uh, the Lyapunov function. This yes, system. in this case, in this case, we can use the, the potential as a Lyapunov function, but only for these two equilibria, because you see that uh, in a neighborhood of these two points, indeed, we have that this function has a, um, a, a minima in this point, but this is not true. So we cannot use this potential as a Lyapunov function for this equilibrium here because the function has a maximum. Or again, we could do that if we do the trick that we talked about yesterday. So if you remember, there was a question yesterday that asked, uh, what if we define a Lyapunov function that instead of having a minimum in an equilibrium has a maximum, then in this case, we have to be careful that the definition of stability and instability are, uh, are switched. So in this case, for example, if we find out that the function is decreasing along the trajectories, then uh, the equilibrium will be unstable. But in general, yes, since this uh, is an energy potential, if, for example, we assume that we are in a frictionless system with no dissipation, and so this quantity is conserved, we can use it as a Lyapunov function. So there is a follow-up question. So if this is not a, a strict Lyapunov function, what is the Lyapunov function for the system? Uh, it depends. I mean, the, it, it depends. In, in this case, I mean, for these two uh, equili equilibria, we can use the function as, as a Lyapunov function. In this case, we cannot, and so we have to use other tools. So we, we can use spectral analysis. We can try to draw the stream plot. Yeah, so whenever we... I think what? That perhaps it's not fully clear that one can cannot always uh, construct a Lyapunov function. Yeah, exactly. This, this is not true in general. I mean, this is a particular case because we know that there is a conserved quantity. If I write any ra random, let's say, nonlinear function with the strange function signs, cosines, uh, powers, exponential, in general, it is not always possible to find a conserved quantity and not even a Lyapunov function. Yeah. So that, that, that's the, I mean, that's the, 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 the big downside of using Lyapunov function. They can tell us a lot about an equilibrium, but they are not always uh, easy to find. It's useful if you can find it. it yeah, exactly. Useful. If you can't, you shouldn't uh, lose your sleep uh, on mm -hmm. finding a Lyapunov function. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the last topic I would like to talk about goes a little bit beyond uh, studying the uh, stability of uh, uh, equilibria. And it's called time scale separation. Now, this is basically a tool that can be used uh, uh, often to simplify the study of nonlinear systems. Now, let me show you in abstract, in a general case, what I mean. And then I will show you two concrete examples to show you how we can use this uh, time scale separation. So uh, this approach can be used uh, when a nonlinear system can be described by two different sets of variables, xi and yj not necessarily of the same number, so they can be of different number, and each one of them has their own uh, nonlinear function, which can be different for these two. Yeah, yeah. Not Sorry? 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 I think it was not a question. Okay. So we have a, uh, we can have different uh, nonlinear functions here. Now, um, what happens often, not only, and this depends on our knowledge on the system, is that we can say, for example, that the time scale of uh, these variables is very different from the time scale of this one. For example, if we are describing a large ecosystem where X is the population of elephants and Y is the population of rats, for example, uh, you, we know, for example, that the reprodu reproduction time of rats is much, much faster than the reproduction time of 
uh, elephants. So we, we can distinguish basically between slow variables and fast variables uh, in the system. Again, I'm going to give you a couple of concrete examples uh, afterwards. Now, if we can do this, so if we can distinguish uh, between slow and fast variables, for example, let's assume in this general case that xi are the slow variables and yj are the fast ones. So what we can do uh, in this case is, I mean, what happens in this case is that the fast variables, so the yj in this case, will reach their stationary values uh, very quickly since they are the fast variables, of course. So what we can do in this case is assuming that y dot j is always equal to zero. Again, let me repeat that in case it is not clear. Uh, if we assume that we can uh, distinguish the system between the slow variables, the x, and fast variables, the y, this means that uh, as the system changes, the y variables will almost instantly uh, reach their stationary values. So we can assume, we can approximate the behavior of these variables by assuming that y dot is always equal to zero. Is that clear? Okay, so what we can do in this case is basically setting uh, this equation uh, equal to zero. So you see that uh, here we can now invert uh, these functions g here to write the fast variables as a function of the slow variables. If we then plug this expression uh, into the equation for the slow variables, we basically have reduced, let's say, the number of variables so that we can describe our system only through the slow variables. Okay? There is a question. Yes. Uh, by Washington Taylor. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, thanks. Quick question. Are you assuming that the yj's have a asymptotic stable equilibrium or something like that? Like if the no, yj no. is oscillating. I, I am not, I am not uh, assuming anything about the equilibria right now. I am just assuming something on the uh, speed, let's say, on which the, the, this, this variable change. So I, it is sufficient that these, for example, set of variables are faster than the other. I'm not assuming anything on the stability or on the existence even of equilibria. I, see. I guess I'm wondering if the yj's don't have a stationary value. In other words, if they're oscillatory on their own. Uh, yeah, that is a case in which uh, you probably can do, uh, you, in which you can't apply this, uh, this approach, I would say. Okay, but you might be able to use some mean values. Or something. Yeah, you can. You probably can use some mean value, particularly for example, if these oscillations are not particularly wide, then you can. You can. You can use it. Sorry. Mas tipo só você que mexe no negociador, né? Na época era era o seu, né? I I don't think I have understood the, if that was a question or. Uh, or not okay okay so again let me repeat that this is an approximation that cannot be done uh, always in any case but it depends on our knowledge of uh, the system so in the example i've given you before of rats and elephants i mean we have to know already that rats reproduce much faster than uh, than, than elephants on in any case we need some phenomenological knowledge on the system to justify uh, this approximation so let me show you two examples, uh, uh, practical examples in which this happens. Now, one uh, class of nonlinear system where this approximation is actually uh, done quite often are chemical reactions. For example, uh, let me introduce this uh, nonlinear system. This is called Gehrer and Meinhardt activator inhibitor equations. Uh, these are nonlinear systems, nonlinear equations, as you can say, and these basically describe the abundance of two chemical substances, X and Y, which are uh, an activator and a, an inhibitor. For example, to make some uh, uh, practical example, X and Y could be uh, two proteins that either activate or inhibit a um, particular uh, metabolic pathway or a particular metabolic reaction. So, Let's assume, for example, that we can tell that the activator is much fast, faster than the, the inhibitor. For example, let's assume that we know how these molecules are made and we can tell, we know that, for example, if we raise the temperature of the system, then the, the activity of this molecule is much larger than the activity of the inhibitor. 
factor. So we have that X, uh, the activator becomes much uh, faster than the inhibitor. Then what we can do in this case is set X dot equal to zero. So that here we can use this equation to write X square as a function of Y. Then we plug this into the equation for y dot, and we obtain this, which basically becomes, let's say, the uh, approximated equation of the system for high temperatures. Because in this case, these variables are the slow one, and so we can describe the system only through this equation, the, this variable, sorry. On the other hand, let's assume that we know that the inhibitor is much faster than the activator. For example, we know how the, uh, again, we know how these molecules are, are made. And we know that if, for example, we lower the temperature, then the inhibitor, the activity of the uh, inhibitor molecule becomes much larger than that of the activator. Then in this case, we can set y dot equal to zero here. So we can write y as a function of x squared like this. We plug it back into the, this equation and we get uh, in this uh, hypothetical example, the uh, approximated equation of our system for lower temperatures. Is that clear? Okay. So the other uh, example, which is actually more relevant for ecology that I wanted to, to show you is the so-called MacArthur consumer resource model. Now, this model basically describes uh, mm, a system of microbial species competing for some common resources. In particular, this here is a schematic representation of the model. We have a set of resources, we have a set of species. Uh, we assume for now, I mean, it's not uh, uh, mandatory, but for simplicity now, we assume that the resources are supplied with constant rates. So this SI here are the supply rates of the resources. And that this species here uh, can only uptake these resources. So we are not modeling any other kind of interaction between the species. Now, in microbial communities, there are lots of phenomena that can happen. We can have biological warfare, so species producing antibiotics for other species, or species producing actually resources, so excreting metabolic byproducts that can be used by other species. So we are excluding all these cases. And we are only describe, describing a system where the species can only uptake the resources and grow. Now, uh, if we build the system, it, it's not necessary for what I want to show you. But if you want, if we have time, I can show you how this model is built. But in the end, the equations of this model look like this, where this here is the set of equation that describes the dynamics of the species population. And this here, on the other hand, is the set of equations that describes the uh, resource, the dynamics of the resources concentrations. Uh, here, I have just uh, called Ri this uh, nonlinear function. So you see that these are, are indeed coupled nonlinear differential equations. Now, what people often do, but I mean, this is not something that people always do, is assuming that the dynamics of the resources is actually much faster than the dynamics of the uh, microbial populations. Now, this generally is justified by the fact that, for example, the molecular dynamics that underlies the uptake and the metabolization of resources, which takes place generally in fractions of second or few seconds, it's actually much faster than the time scale over which the species grow, because microbial species take at least several minutes, if not hours or days to grow. So in this case, you see that we know from experiments, for, for example, that we can define this as the fa uh, fast variables of our system and this as the slow variables. So if we can do that, we can set ci dot equal to zero here. And we can write, as you can see, this function ri as a function of a sum of uh, all the populations. If we plug it back, to the first set of couple differential equations, you see that in the end, we can describe the system by only using the uh, species populations without considering the resources concentrations. Now, an interesting case is basically this model. That, I mean, there is an interesting case if we consider the same model in a slightly different setting. In particular, these here are the uh, consumer resource uh, uh, equations with two differences with respect to before. Here, I am not writing the nonlinear function Ri that I was using before, but I am just using uh, Ci. 
But on the other hand, the resources now are not be supplied uh, with constant rate, but I have written, as you can see, a logistic term, a logistic equation for their growth. So if we do this, so for example, I mean, one case in which this could be a good, uh, uh, a good description of the system could be, for example, a system with uh, phytoplankton, where the resources would be phytoplankton, and uh, the populations here would be zooplankton, of course we still have to be sure that the other assumptions of the model are true. So the zooplankton are only eating the phytoplankton and not, not eating other, uh, other species. But as long as these assumptions are true, we can use this model. If we now assume, for example, that in a particular system, we know that phytoplankton is growing much faster than uh, zooplankton. So we can assume that the CI here, again, are the fast variable. So we can set ci dot equal to zero and write ci as a function of uh, all the rest. If we now plug, uh, plug this back into this equation and do some rearranging, I mean, I'm not going to show you just because it's just very boring computations and we have only five minutes left. But in the end, we get these equations here, where here I'm showing you the definitions of, the param of these parameters. This is actually an interesting result because these equations here are called the generalized lotka volterra equations. These are basically a generalized version of the lotka volterra equations for system with more than one species. And so you see that by doing this time scale separation approximation and not considering the uh, equations for uh, the resources, we can actually uh, simplify this model basically to the generalized lotka volterra equations. Okay, with that, I, I have finished all the things that I wanted to tell you in this tutorial. So I will be happy to take questions in this last few minutes. Yes, so we have uh, a few minutes for questions. I encourage you to ask uh, Leonardo any doubt you might have. Please raise your hand with the Zoom feature if you have any question. I hope this means that I was clear. <laughs> <laughs> I will take that as a as a, as a proof of as evidence of that. Okay. So, uh, oh, there is a question. Perhaps. Okay, great. Thank you for giving the talk. Your volume is very low. Yeah, your volume is very low. I cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, what I'm saying is that if you can come back in the. Uh, I, I can maybe if you write in the chat because I really cannot hear what you're saying. Okay, no problem. Let me see. Perhaps while uh, Mohamed is writing the question, there is another question by Pablo. So please uh, okay. uh, ask your question and then we'll go back to Mohamed's question. Thank you. Um, so I, I didn't understand very well why, so if the resources uh, dynamic are fast, mm -hmm. um, how can you make the derivative equal to zero? Wouldn't that mean that the resource dynamics are slow compared to the population growth? Uh, so that you can consider it constant and therefore the derivative equals zero? Not necessarily. I mean, what, what would that mean basically? I mean, let me draw this here. Probably this is going to be clearer. So in general, if we didn't make this assumption, let me write, okay, we would have a solution for the populations and a solution for the resources. So in general, we would have that here, I don't know, we would have a general behavior. Let's assume that the populations at a certain point converge to a value. And even here, we would have something like that. So some oscillation, some strange behavior. And then um, these, these functions here tend to a stationary value. Setting ci dot equal to zero in that case means basically assuming that these variables here are so fast that since the beginning, they are already equal to their stationary values. 
So in, in this sense, they would be they would not change, but they are already in the stationary values. I mean, it it it, it can seem like a strange approximation. In most cases, can be a strange approximation, but there can be cases in which this actually is a, a good approximation. So again, this depends on our knowledge of the system and what we know about it. It's not something that we can do in general. Okay, thank you, thank you. No problem. Um, so there, there is a question, uh, Mohamed, who at the, not the question and the, when do we have to deal with the Lyapunov exponents? When, when do we have, sorry? To deal with the Lyapunov exponents. Uh, again, uh, uh, probably it's not going to be a satisfactory answer, but it depends on the system. I mean, uh, if, uh, if you see that you have a system uh, where you can easily find a function with all the property that the, the, the Lyapunov function must have, then that is a case where you can deal with the with Lyapunov functions. But, uh, if you see that you can't and you don't find an easy way to, to, to look for the Apuno functions, and I, I'm so I mean, it's not my fault, but this is purely driven by intuition, then in that case, it's better to just use other tools, use uh, linear stability, draw the stream plots, uh, make some numerical uh, simulations. So any kind of other tools that we can use that can help us understand something about the stability of the equilibrium. I hope this was clear. There is uh, another question by uh, Leni. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I just want to clarify my understanding. So basically, we just we can use time scale um, separation. Mm -hmm. uh, then hopefully, then we can get to a lotka volter equations, and then after which we can just use the second theorem of Lyapunov to study the stability. Yeah, yeah. If we are in one in one of the cases where the the time scale separation uh, approximation actually makes sense, yes, we can do that. And uh, I mean, this is something that people sometimes do. They start from a consumer reduced model, then they assume this separation of time scale, and then they work with uh, Lotka Volterra equations. I mean, the, if if you want, this can also give you an, an in, a different interpretation of these generalized Lotka Volterra equations because they they basically come from a competitive system, and so I mean, you, you can also interpret them in a, in a different light. But yes, I mean, this is something that, that that can be done, of course. And sorry if I uh, continue to repeat myself. If we know that we are in a case where we can do this time scale separation, and again, this depends only on the knowledge that we have of, of the system. So if we have some empirical, some experimental knowledge that these two set of sets of variable are actually very fast or, or very low, or if we have any other kind of intuition that can uh, justify us to, to do so. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. No problem. There is another question uh, in the chat from uh, Solmas. So uh, she's asking again about the time separation. Uh, so it, Without the time scale difference, is it impossible to find a single equation for a 2D system? Yes, if you don't, I mean, mm, uh, for sure there will be cases, particular cases in which you can do that. But in general, if you are in the, in the situation where you can describe the system with two sets of variables and you can't justify the time scale separation, you just have to study the equations uh, with all the, 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 the variables all together. Again, there can be particular cases that I am not aware of in which this could happen, but the general rule is, uh, is this. I hope this answers the, the question. Great. There is a, uh, okay. There is a question by Dabas Mita. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, so I just want to know that uh, what is the broader sense of uh, applying time scale separation. So suppose my system, I know that it can go through the, uh, it has slow and fast variables, mm -hmm. but uh, what is the output I will be expecting after applying this method? The, simply a simplification of the system. So assume, uh, for example, that in, in uh, let, let's consider this case. So assume that we have a system with uh, 80 species and uh, 50 resources. These are large numbers, but if you compare them with what you can see in natural microbial communities, these are not so uh, large numbers. So if you have 80 equations here and 50 equations here, 
without time scale separation, you would have to solve 130 different uh, nonlinear differential equations. If you can apply time scale separation, you reduce this number basically to uh, back to 80 because you are eliminating, uh, more or less, you are reducing the number of equations from 130 to 80. So the advantage in this sense is simply the fact that you are simplifying a very complicated uh, model, a very complicated system. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Great. So is there any other question? We have in principle five minutes. Yes, there is another one by Sri Rama, please. Yeah, uh, thank, you. thank you for uh, the talk. It's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I have one uh, small question in this uh, time scale dynamics. Uh, can we have this, uh, what is that? Uh, we can take normal resource consumer system and we assume initially one, one is a faster, another one is a slower and repeat reverse it. Can we get some boundedness of these solutions? Uh, I, I wouldn't know in general. Probably again, I, I'm sorry if again, this is not a satisfactory uh, answer, but uh, I think that you would have to go in on a case by case uh, approach in this case. So. Uh, looking at actually, for example, how the parameter, how large or how small the parameters are, and see if you can get uh, intuitively any bound in, uh, in this case. Because initially, if you instead of solving the original system, can we get the bound for the original system or something like that by using time scale? Mm, I think that would be possible, but I, I, again, I, 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 I'm, I wouldn't say always. Again, sorry, sorry again if this is not a satisfactory answer. No, thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Nonlinear dynamics is full of questions that don't have a satisfactory answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, is there any other question? Uh, uh, great. So, um, I think uh, we can go in, uh, I mean, take a break for uh, three, four minutes. Uh,